Okay, here we are in 10.4, talking about Pascal's triangle. Um, you may have heard of Pascal's triangle before. In fact, 10.3, uh, where we talk about permutations and combinations. Um, if you've been through intermediate algebra, which you, you should have for this class, um, you are you should already be already be familiar with um, combinations because they show up when you talk about the binomial theorem at the end of an intermediate algebra class, which we are also going to talk about here. Um, Pascal's triangle is a triangular array of numbers. What we see are the first several rows of it here. The triangle actually goes on forever. It's infinite. It just keeps uh, adding rows indefinitely. But obviously you can't write infinitely many rows of this thing, so we just show the first part of it. Um, here's how uh, Pascal's triangle is created. This top number here is just a 1, by definition. And then along the edges of the triangle, the two, the left and right outer edges, those are all defined to be ones as well. The remaining numbers in Pascal's triangle come from the numbers above it in the sense that we add them. So for example, you notice you have a two here. That two came from one plus one. I added one plus one to create that two. Where did these threes come from? One plus two is three. Two plus one is three, okay? What about the numbers in this row? How did I get a four? Well, four is equal to one plus three, six is equal to three plus three, and four is equal to three plus one. Notice all of the numbers, which you can verify this, they come from the sum of the two numbers directly above it. 21 is six plus 15, 35 is 20 plus 15, so on and so forth, okay? That's how you create Pascal's triangle. And so if you needed the next row in this triangle, you could just add each consecutive pair of numbers to get that entire row, remembering that the outer, the outsides need to be ones, okay? Now, right now this is just, you know, a neat little triangle of numbers. Obviously we wouldn't be talking about it if it weren't useful for something. So we're going to show uh, how it's useful in a moment, but before we can do that we need to talk about how we enumerate the rows and the entries of this triangle. So in Pascal's triangle, Again, we think of these as rows, but we start counting at row 0 instead of row 1. So this row right here, I think of that as row 0, not row 1. And then I start counting from there. This I think of as row 1, this is row 2, and so on and so forth. Row 3, okay? And then we also, once we've decided on a row, we enumerate the entries within that row, but we also start at zero. So for example, this entry right here is entry zero, let's call it entry zero, in row four, okay? And this entry right here, notice it's in row five, row three, row four, row five, but what entry is it? Well, if we start at one and we count that as entry zero, that's zero, one, two, three, four. I would call that entry four of row five, okay? So remembering that we start with zero, we start our counts at zero, both for the rows and the entries within a row, we can identify any number in this triangle by its address, its row and its entry. So for example, what number is in entry zero of row four? Well, here's row four. And here's entry 0. We already identified it. That was 1. What number is in entry 3 of row 6? Well, again, you start counting the rows at 0. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. This is row 6. What is entry 3? Start counting at 0. 0, 1, 2, 3. It's that 20 right there. Okay, that's how we identify numbers in Pascal's triangle. What's the relevance of Pascal's triangle? Again, we wouldn't be talking about it if it didn't have some kind of usefulness. It turns out that all of the combinations that we talked about in the previous section, 10.3, combinations specifically, not permutations, every combination that you can come up with is in Pascal's triangle. In fact, that's what all of these numbers are. These are combinations. But what combinations specifically? Well, if you want to evaluate the combination n choose r, the trick is to find the nth row of Pascal's triangle and search for the rth entry. It will always equal n choose r. Let's 
verify that with some examples. So first of all, we want to evaluate these two combinations. Let's start with seven choose four. And we're gonna use Pascal's triangle to do it, but then we're gonna verify it using the normal formula for a combination. Seven choose four from Pascal's, well actually let's, let's do the formula first. I'm gonna do this in the other order. That's equal to seven factorial over four factorial times seven minus four factorial, which is seven factorial over four factorial times three factorial. Cancel the seven factorial with the four factorial. It gives me seven times six times five over three times two times one. Three times two is six, that'll cancel with that six. And then I have seven times five over one, which is left, that's 35. So seven choose four is equal to 35. Now, if we wanna use Pascal's triangle, I'm looking for row seven, entry four. Here's row three, four, five, six, seven. Here's row seven, entry four, zero, one, two, three, four. It's right there. Same number, 35. Interesting. Let's do the same thing with five choose two. How do you evaluate five choose two using the formula? It's five factorial over two factorial times five minus two factorial or five factorial over two factorial times three factorial. Cancel the five factorial with the three factorial. That gives me five times four over two times one. That's 20 over two or 10. But what, what would we be looking for in Pascal's triangle? Well, we're looking for row five, entry two. Okay, row three, row four, row five is right here. Entry two, remember we start counting by uh, at zero. Zero, one, two. It's 10, same number that we got by using our combination. And so what Pascal's triangle does for us is if we have it available, we can find combinations very, very quickly without having to do this formula. Now, you'll kind of see that there are times when you want to use the formula instead of Pascal's triangle. For example, if I'm doing that problem where uh, we found the total number of five card poker hands, that was 52 choose five. That means you would need to look at row 52 of Pascal's triangle and then find the fifth entry. I only have up to row seven here. If you want row 52 and you don't have a printout of Pascal's triangle that goes that far, you have to come up with that on your own. And even though coming up with these numbers is not difficult, that's a lot of rows to fill in just to find that combination, which you can much more quickly do using the formula. But if you have Pascal's triangle in front of you and you already have the row that you need, or as we're going to see at the end of this section, if you're doing a problem where you need an entire row's worth of combinations, Pascal's triangle is really handy. So let's do an example. Okay, it says a fair coin is tossed six times in a row. How many ways, or in how many ways, can tails appear exactly four times? Okay, so let's think about this for a moment. Because <clears throat> again, we want to think of this in terms of combinations. We just found that we can find combinations in Pascal's triangle, so there's probably a way to uh, think of this in terms of combinations. Um, now, uh, we're, we're tossing a coin six times in a row. So let's, let's think about what a sequence of coin flips might look like that meet this criteria. Tails appearing exactly four times. Tails, 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 tails. That's four tails. And then two heads. Remember, I do a total of six coin tosses, but two, uh, four of them have to be tails, exactly four of them. And I'm thinking of this as the first coin toss, second, third, and so on. Okay, that's one way that that can appear. What's another way that that can happen? Tails, 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 heads, tails, heads. That's another possible combination. Oops, I'm sorry, I put too many. I put too many there. Oh, no, actually, sorry, back that up. That doesn't work. Um, tails, 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 heads, tails, heads. I had one too many tails up there before. Here's another combination, or uh, another way of flipping a coin six times in a row such that tails appears four times but this is considered different from this because of where the four tails appeared, right? Here's another possibility. Heads, heads, tails, 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 tails. Now obviously if I'm trying to find all of the different possibilities, systematically listing like this is probably gonna take too long. So how can I reframe 
this, this problem in terms of a combination. Well, let's think of it this way. Let's think of the positions of these T's as, uh, as the set that I'm choosing from, okay? So um, instead of thinking of this in T's and H's, let's think of uh, this as position one, two, three, four, five, and six, okay? If I want to uh, get tails for my first four positions, I would think of this as the set containing one, two, three, and four. The idea is that I'm associating these T's with the positions that they're appearing in. Now this set would be considered the same as four, three, two, one. Either of those two sets are just saying that I have tails in my first four positions here. This set right here, I could think of as the set one, two, three, five, because I have tails in the first, second, third, and fifth positions in this list. This could be thought of as the set uh, three, four, five, six, because I have tails appearing in the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth positions. Now I have a total of six pos positions to choose from, and in each case I'm selecting four of those positions to put my tails into. That sounds like a combination problem to me. Six positions to choose from, four positions that I want to choose. So that's six choose four. Now I could use the formula here, but this in Pascal's triangle would be the fourth entry of the sixth row. And I happen to have the sixth row right here. What is the fourth entry? Zero, one, two, three, four. It's 15. So we use Pascal's triangle instead of the formula since we already had that entry available to us. Okay? All right. So what we're going to uh, apply Pascal's triangle to, and this is really the more useful application of it, is something that we call the binomial theorem. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk you through uh, where the binomial theorem comes from. We're going to state it, and then we're going to use it in a couple of examples. This goes back to algebra. In algebra, you learn about these things called binomials. A binomial is a polynomial with exactly two terms. X plus Y is an example of a binomial. And what you spend a lot of time doing in uh, algebra is multiplying binomials, or raising them to powers, in this case specifically. X plus Y is a binomial, and we're raising it to the power of N, where N is some natural number, some positive integer. Now, if N is equal to 2, then that's x plus y squared, and you can write that as x plus y times x plus y and use the FOIL technique, which is something that you learn about in Algebra 1, in elementary algebra. That's a pretty familiar one. But once n gets to a number that's larger than 2, that process becomes a lot more complicated. For example, if n was equal to 3, we're looking at x plus y cubed, and that is the same thing as x plus y times x plus y times x plus y. The direct way of multiplying this out is to use FOIL on the first two, which would give me a, a new polynomial, and then distribute all of the terms from that polynomial into this third one, and then combine a bunch of like terms. And that works fine, but it's a time-consuming process, and we want to come up with a way of doing that faster. So we're going to approach this in a systematic way. Um, the first observation I want to make is how we can get individual terms out of a product like this. Basically what we're doing, as a consequence of the distributive property that you learn in algebra, um, terms from the expanded form of this product come from taking exactly one term in each set of parentheses and multiplying them together. So for example, if I take this x and multiply it to this x and multiply it to this x, I'll get an x cubed. If I take this x and multiply it to this y and then multiply that to this x, I have two x's that multiply to make an x squared and a y. That becomes x squared y. But notice I'm choosing, there's the word choose, I'm choosing one term from each of these sets of parentheses to multiply together. And that's what creates these terms in this, in this expanded polynomial that I'm looking for. Okay, so the question now is how can we systematically think of all the different ways of doing that? Well, notice, I, I'm going to do this by focusing on the y's, actually. What are the different possible ways of choosing y's? It's possible that I, uh, in that selection process, that I choose zero y's. x times x times x is a way of choosing elements or choosing terms from these parentheses such that no y's are chosen. Um, how many different ways can I select exactly one y term? Well, I can do y 
xx, I can do xyx, or I can do xxy. In all of those cases, the term that comes from doing the multiplication is x squared y, because I've chosen two x's and one y. Um, what's the most number of y's that I can choose in this process? Well, that would be three, y, y, y. Okay, so what we're going to do is is basically that, that process. We're going to think of all the different ways we can choose, choose y exactly 0, 1, 2, or 3 times, because those are the only possibilities if I go about this in this way. And I'm going to do that in, in, in kind of like the, posing a question and then answering it. How many ways can we select 0 y terms in that process? Well, there's only one way, choosing all three of them, y times y times y which is equal to y cubed. No, 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 I'm sorry. I'm, I'm using the wrong term. If I choose zero y terms, then that means all three of my choices are x's. Okay, so if I choose all three x's, that's x cubed, or x times x times x, which is x cubed. There's only one way to choose that. Um, and framing that in, in the form of a combination, if I have three y's to choose from, and I'm choosing zero of them, three choose zero is equal to one. I know this from Pascal's triangle. Here's row 3, entry 0 is equal to 1. Okay, And because there are no y's that are chosen in that process, all three cho choices have to be x's, which gives me an x cubed. So I have one x cubed term in this expansion. How many different ways can I select exactly one y term in that process? Well, again, rather than kind of you know, thinking it all out the way that we did before, Let's be more systematic in our approach. I have three different y terms to choose from, and I'd like to choose exactly one of those. As a combination, that's three choose one, which from Pascal's triangle or the formula is equal to three. Now, when you, when you choose that exactly one y term, that means your other two choices are x's. So the terms that you get from choosing exactly one y term will look like x squared y. But according to this, this term will show up exactly three times, x squared y plus x squared y plus x squared y. Combining those like terms gives me a coefficient of three, three x squared y. We keep doing this, okay? So how many different ways can I choose exactly two y terms? Well, again, three y's to choose from, and I'm choosing two of them. That's three choose two, which is equal to three, either from Pascal's triangle or the formula. And again, if I choose exactly two of my terms to be y's, then the other choice has to be an x, which means the products in those cases will look like xy squared. If I have three of those, I add them together and get three xy squared. Finally, how many different ways can we select exactly three y terms from those three choices? That's three choose three, which equals one. And if all three of our terms are y's, then none of them will be x's, and they multiply to make a y cubed. Taking those four results and putting them together, what we get from multiplying this whole thing out is uh, <clears throat> right here, x squared plus 3x squared y plus 3xy squared plus y cubed. But then to think a little bit more, because remember, this is one example, and we want, we want to notice a pattern that can give us a more general formula. The coefficients on this uh, polynomial in particular all come from those combinations that we saw. Notice that the coefficient here is a 1, the coefficient here is a 1. The coefficients here were 3 and 3. Those came from different combinations. 3 choose 0, 3 choose 1, 3 choose 2, 3 choose 3. So if I write those as combinations down here, there's a pattern emerging. And what I would like to do is see if I can generalize that pattern. So <clears throat> for any one of these terms, there's essentially three parts to it. There's the combination, there's the x to some exponent, and then there's the y to some exponent. And let's see if there's a pattern. Starting with the combinations, every combination that appears in this expansion has a three. It's three choose something. And I start with three choose zero, but then the number that's, that I'm choosing in each uh, consecutive term goes up by one. So three choose zero, three choose one, three choose two, three choose three. This number is increasing by one each time. The exponent on my x starts at three, which is the same number that I have here, three and three. And then the exponent on that x starts to count down, three, so x cubed, two x squared, 
1. Even though you don't see it, that's x to the 1. And there, here we don't see an x at all. But notice I could have written x to the 0 power here because x to the power of 0 equals 1, and that just simplifies to this. So the exponent on my x starts with whatever this number was and then counts down to 0. Meanwhile, my y begins with an exponent of 0. Again, I could have written y to the 0 right here because that's equal to 1, and then it counts its way up. y to the 0, y to the 1, y to the 2, y to the 3. That pattern is not coincidental, and the way that we established this can be done um, where instead of having a third power here, we have any natural number exponent, and a similar pattern would emerge. That leads to this thing that we call the binomial theorem. Now this looks really messy, but basically what this is is just the generalized version of the same pattern we saw right here. If I have x plus y to the power of n, where n is any natural number, then that's always going to expand to this big polynomial. Now again, look for the pattern. Each term has a combination in it. So I have a term here, I have a term here, one here, and then the dot 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 is just to show that there's a bunch of terms in between. And if you look at the combinations in each case, the exponent that I was raising this, uh, this to, this x plus y, is the number that I'm choosing from, n in each case. Then my combinations count from 0 up to n. n choose 0, n choose 1, n choose 2, until I get to n choose n. In this case up here, n was just equal to 3. But that's the same thing that we observed. Then I also have x to the power of n, the same n that's appearing here, and that exponent counts down. So n here, n minus 1 here, n minus 2 here. Eventually we get x to the power of 1, and then x to the power of 0, and in that case we don't even write the x. The exponents on my y's start at 0 and then count up. y to the 0, y to the first power, y to the second power. This continues all the way to these last couple of terms until I eventually get to y to the nth power. And this is what we call the binomial theorem. So let's use that in a straightforward example. How do I expand x plus y to the fifth power? Well, this would be equal to, first of all, notice what n is. n is 5 in this case. 5, choose 0, following this pattern, x to the power of n, which is 5, x to the fifth, plus 5, choose 1. Remember, this number counts up. The exponent on my x counts down, and the exponent on my y counts up. y to the 0 here, y to the first here. 5 choose 2 would be next. Count down with my x exponent. Count up with my y's exponent. Plus 5 choose 3. Continuing to count down, that's x squared and y cubed. Plus 5 choose 4. x to the first power, we just write x in that case y to the fourth, plus 5, choose 5, x to the 0, which we don't write, and then y to the fifth. Okay? One thing that's also worth noting, if you take the exponents on your x and your y, they always add up to n, which again in this case is 5. 4 plus 1 is 5, 3 plus 2 is 5, 2 plus 3 is 5, and so on. Okay? Now, I'm not satisfied with this because I want to put numbers in for each of these combinations. And this is where Pascal's triangle is really useful. Notice, if I'm trying to find these combinations in Pascal's triangle, in each case, I'm looking at row 5. In fact, I want row 5 entry 0, row 5 entry 1, row 5 entry 2, all the way to row 5 entry 5. That's actually all of the entries that exist in row 5. This is why we like Pascal's triangle. Where is row 5 in Pascal's triangle? Row 3, row 4, row 5, right here. 1, 5, 10, 10, 5, 1. Those, ex those exact numbers will be the coefficients in order on this thing. 1 times x squared, or x to the fifth, plus the next entry was 5, x to the fourth, y. Next entry was 10, x cubed, y cubed, plus another 10, x squared, y cubed, plus another 5, um, x y to the fourth plus one and we don't write the one typically y to the fifth notice that was a two-step problem and really this step could have been the could have been the first step if I just knew this pattern with combinations and use Pascal's triangle now imagine trying to multiply this thing out the long way it would have taken a much much longer amount of time okay 
I want to do another example, but one thing I, I do want to mention about Pascal's triangle really quickly is that there's a whole lot more to this thing. Um, there are lots and lots and lots of really interesting patterns that occur in this in Pascal's triangle. For example, you may notice some symmetry. Look at any row. They appear to be symmetric. 1, 5, 10, and then the same numbers backwards. 10, 5, 1. There's a reason for that. Another interesting pattern happens if you add up all of the numbers in any given row. They always add up to a power of 2. We're not going to explore all that stuff because that's we don't have the time for that. But I do want to mention it because it's, it's an interesting thing worth looking at if you want to go a little deeper. Okay? One last example. I want to find the coefficient on the x cubed term in the expansion of this. So notice I'm not doing what I did in the previous example. I'm not multiplying the entire thing out. I only want one of the coefficients on one of the terms in this. Notice also that this is not the standard x plus y anymore. It's 2x minus 3. In this case, instead of x, uh, like the x that I have here, I'm thinking of that as 2x. And instead of plus y, like what I have here, I have minus 3, which you can think of as plus negative 3. So 2x and negative 3. Those are the things that are going to take the place of x and y in the um, binomial theorem. Now again, I only care about the x cubed term. Where am I going to get x cubed from? Well, it's going to become it's going to come from cubing this guy right here. So I'm going to have 2x cubed showing up. In the binomial theorem, when I'm cubing that first term, uh, notice what's happening. I have 5 choose 2 in this case. Notice that we talked about the pattern about this number counting up, but notice that this number also always matches the exponent on my second term, my y. So 2 and 2 here, 3 and 3, 4 and 4, and so on and so forth. Um, and then the other thing we notice is that these two exponents always add up to n, whatever n happens to be. So again, I'm not expanding this whole thing out. I'm just looking for one term in that expansion. And I know that in order to get an x cubed, that's going to come from cubing this guy, 2x cubed. But then I also have this negative 3. And that's going to have to be raised to a power also. I know that that is also going to be a 3. Because again, the sum of these two exponents should equal this. Finally, part of this coefficient is going to be a, co uh, a combination. The combination is n, which is 6. Choose, and based on that pattern we just talked about, this number should match this exponent, 3. Okay, So that's 6 choose 3 times 2x cubed times negative 3 cubed. Now from Pascal's triangle, if we look for 6 choose 3, I'm not going to go back to the triangle, but again, you're looking in row 6, entry 3, you would find that that's equal to 20. 2x cubed is equal to 8x cubed. It's 2x quantity cubed. And then you cube the 2 and you cube the x. It's 8x cubed. Negative 3 to the third power is negative 27. If you uh, multiply all of this out, you get negative 4,320 x cubed. The coefficient is that part. So the answer to this is negative 4,321. Okay, that's going to wrap up 10.4 for us.